The Cloisters, written by Katie Hayes, published by Atria Books in November of 2022, with a snippet read by Richard Coombs. Available for checkout right now at the Alice Pendleton Library. Death always visited me in August. A slow and delicious month we turned into something swift and brutal. The change, quick as a card trick. I should have seen it coming, the way the body would be laid out on the library floor, the way the gardens would be torn apart by the search, the way our jealousy, greed, and ambition were waiting to devour us all like a snake eating its own tail. The Ouroboros. And even though I know the dark truths we hid from one another that summer, some part of me still longs for the cloisters, for the person I was before. I used to think it might have gone either way, that I might have said no to the job or to Leo, that I might never have gone to Long Lake that summer night, that the coroner, even, might have decided against an autopsy. But those choices were never mine to make. I know that now. I think a lot about luck these days. Luck. Probably from the Middle High German Gluck, meaning fortune or happy accident, Dante called fortune the Ministra de Dio, or the Minister of God. Fortune, just an old-fashioned word for fate. The ancient Greeks and Romans did everything in the service of fate. They built temples in its honor and bound their lives to its capricious. They consulted sibyls and prophets. They scried the entrails of animals and studied omens. Even Julius Caesar is said to have crossed the Rubicon only after casting a pair of dice. Iacta ale est. The die is cast. The entire fate of the Roman Empire depended on that throw. At least Caesar was lucky once. What if our whole life, how we live and die, has already been decided for us? Would you want to know if a roll of the dice or a deal of the cards could tell you the outcome? Can life be that thin, that disturbing? What if we are all just Caesar, waiting on our lucky throw, refusing to see what waits for us in the Ides of March? It was easy, at first, to miss the omens that haunted the cloisters that summer, the gardens always spilling over with wildflowers and herbs, Terracotta pots planted with lavender, and the pink lady apple tree blooming sweet and white. The air so hot our skin stayed damp and flushed. An inescapable future that found us not the other way around. An unlucky throw. One that I could have foreseen if only I, like the Greeks and Romans, had known what to look for. I would arrive in New York at the beginning of June at a time when the heat was building, gathering in the asphalt, reflecting off the glass, until it reached a peak that wouldn't release long into September. I was going east, unlike so many of the students from my class at Whitman College who were headed west towards Seattle and San Francisco, sometimes Hong Kong. The truth was, I wasn't going east to the place I had originally hoped, which was Cambridge or New Haven, or even Williamstown. But when the emails came from department chairs saying they were very sorry, a competitive applicant pool, best of luck in your future endeavors, I was grateful that one application had yielded a positive result. The Summer Associates Program at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. A favor I knew to my emeritus advisor, Richard Lingraff, who had once been something of an Ivy League luminary before the East Coast weather, or was it a questionable happening at his alma mater, had chased him west. They called it an associate's program, but it was an internship with a meager stipend. It didn't matter to me. I wouldn't have worked two jobs and paid them to be there. It was, after all, the Met, the kind of prestigious imperimateur someone like me, a hick from an unknown school, needed. Well, Whitman wasn't entirely unknown, but because I had grown up in Walla Walla, the dusty single-story town in southeastern Washington where Whitman was located, I rarely encountered anyone from out of state who knew of its existence. My whole childhood had been the college, an experience that had slowly dulled much of its magic, 
Where other students arrived on campus excited to start their adult lives anew, I was afforded no such clean state. This was because both of my parents worked for Whitman. My mother, in dining services, where she planned menus and theme nights for the first-year students who lived in the residence halls, Basque, Ethiopian, Asado, if I had lived on campus, she might have planned my meals too, but the financial waiver Whitman granted employees only extended to tuition, and so I lived at home. My father, however, had been a linguist, although not one on faculty, an autodictat who borrowed books from Whitman's Penrose Library. He taught me the differences between the six Latin cases and how to parse rural Italian dialects, all in between his facilities shifts at the college. That is, before he was buried next to my grandparents the summer before my senior year behind the Lutheran church at the edge of town, the victim of a hit and run. He never told me where his love of languages had come from, just that he was grateful I shared it.